is it? <laughs> Did mine show up for me to see as well? Well, I see yours. Oh, do you? Okay. Yeah, I see yours. I don't see mine, but that's, that's okay. <laughs> You know what you said, right? <laughs> so maybe. <laughs> These are great. Wow. Oh. So we're just doing uh, one more minute of chat box check-in, a highlight from the last day or last few days. Awesome. Our last few folks are trickling in. Um, once again, sorry about the confusion and the link issue, um, but hopefully we'll get everyone here with us and I'm recording for anyone who misses the first few minutes. Um, and um, we're really delighted to have Sharon and Omi here with us tonight. And um, Two Trees has had the fortune of doing some work with Sharon and Omi. And uh, we were hoping to have Two Trees kind of start with a with an introduction of your your connection before we dive into some of the, the meaty stuff of this module. Hi. Um, well, I don't know. You know, um, some of my um, my introduction to Sharon and Omi is actually through Mystique <laughs> because I met them at the Thousand Currents Academy last year. And they did the first day of kind of introducing the participants to the space and the work ahead. And I didn't get to go to that session, but the mystique of it really kind of caught me and the place and everything on fire. So I would say that's really my first introduction was through the mystique of that, of that experience. Um, but uh, last summer, last July, uh, when we were in with batch two, in the Bay Area, Omi and Sharon did a workshop with us outdoors in Lake Merritt Park. And um, it was, um, you know, I've, I've done a lot of workshops with a lot of people and I, I get kind of jaded. And I am always really struck when I not only learn something, um, but that I learn something about myself that I didn't know until that moment and that I had access to things in myself that I didn't know I had access to until that moment. And that was the kind of experience that was. So, um, I'm so that makes me so thrilled to have them in this circle tonight. And also um, that they always laugh. There's always laughter 
And that has got to be good for the soul anywhere, anytime, with anybody. <laughs> Amen. So that's the best I can do as an introduction for you all. Uh, but I'm just, my heart is just thrilled that you're here. Thank you. We are very honored to be here. Yes. And it was a beautiful intro. Yeah. <laughs> Well, what would also be lovely is maybe if you wanted to offer a few words yourselves to introduce yourselves to our students and colleagues here. Hmm. <laughs> I saw the handoff go to me. Uh, well, hello, everybody. It's really great to be working with, I'm going to call it this community. Again, it's the Two Trees, Matt, <laughs> Emil community. Um, I am an artist scholar. I'm a writer and a performer, and I teach at the uh, University of Texas at Austin, where I am using scholarship in my classroom pedagogy to explore ways of deepening our human connections to one another. And I am a writer and performing artist. I've been a self-employed artist since 1998. I was raised artistically by artists who were activists, that uh, people who used art as a vehicle for social justice. And um, when I did have day jobs, they were in uh, community organizing. So I kind of approach um, art making as, as a community building um, practice. And for me, I see it as a spiritual practice and a place for me to thrive and grow and offer and serve. Thank you. Um, yeah, the two of you couldn't have articulated a better intro <laughs> as it relates to the module we're in right now. Oh, good, good, good. So, yeah. um, we were hoping to hear a little bit of how you've come to the work that you are doing currently. If you wanted to share, um, jump in just a little bit about about that as well. <laughs> okay, I received that on me. <laughs> you guys do good passes. <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, my current project is called That Black Mermaid Man Lady, and it is a project that um, has multiple um, entry points and multiple ways that it will live, but the primary kind of biggest point of it is that a cohort of Black artists in Minneapolis at the end of the process will be able to purchase a home. And we believe that artists, um, you know, we that are working on the project and, and we being me and all the people that raised me, uh, believe that artists are leaders and that artists um, deserve and need uh, security. Um, they need to be able to thrive and that um, in doing that, they will provide space for others to heal, grow, thrive, and um, be expressed. And so it's a project that's very, very dear to my heart for a lot of reasons that I can come back to later. But that's what I'm focusing on now. And it's just that I've been working on it for a very long time. Um, and it's at the point where I can see the premiere in the near future, like 2018. I can see it. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have a number of things happening. And I think that they all connect around an exploration of how we can live better together. Um, one of those projects is around gentrification. I bring students from the University of Texas to, I'll be bringing them to LA now, to study gentrification, particularly in predominantly brown and black areas of that city. And what the students are charged with doing is first, some self-exploration so that they understand what it means for them to be out of their familiar territory of Austin, Texas, and in a new 
setting. Uh, so they do some of the initial self-reflexive work of ethnography and, and that is the core. And then they have to take, I'll say an art approach to gentrification, which for my students means that they have to create exercises, embodied exercises, exercises that require movement and collaboration that help to illustrate whatever the research area was that they were investigating. Um, then they present these exercises to the communities uh, where they've been working. And hopefully we, we generate some other ways of thinking about and responding to gentrification. Mm -hmm. I, I also have been doing more creative writing recently than scholarly writing. And uh, one of those things is around a collection of short stories that I call mm -hmm. Sitting in a Saucer. Uh, and one of them, uh, actually, Two Trees read, Sharon has read all of them many times. <laughs> <laughs> Two Trees uh, read one of them recently. <clears throat> and I love these stories. They, they come forward. They're telling the story of a little black girl growing up in the suburbs of Chicago in the 1950s and her awareness of race, of gender, of sexuality, and class. <clears throat> Excuse me. What I've been doing with these stories is performing them with audience witness engagement. So there are activities that go with the stories as I, as I perform them. So the, the through line with these things is if we do things together, if we make a meal, if we dance, if we garden, if we do things together, it makes a difference in how we understand our humanity and our relationship to other people. Um, so I think that that's the through line. There's some other things that I'm working on uh, as well, but, but the through line, the connective tissue really is that. Doing together shifts our molecules. So. Thank you. Um, well, our, our aim for tonight was to bring the three of you, Omi, Sharon, and Two Trees, into a sort of fishbowl conversation. And we have a couple of prompts that we came up with. And we know you've had a chance to look at the essential questions for this module um, that's entitled Creating Conditions. And in this module, we've been thinking a lot and um, exploring a lot what it means to find center and to move away and back into a space that is center. Um, and so I'm going to share uh, one of our questions that we thought might kick off the conversation, but we've also invited everyone to come with some questions for you from their work in the module and from the opportunity to see your videos. So um, the question that we were hoping to kind of dive in with is, um, does this idea and this language of center resonate with you? And what thoughts might you have about that? Um, just about what does center mean for you and how might it relate to doubt and sureness and um, places between? I can uh, say I, I I love the idea of being centered. Of when I think of being centered, I also think of being rooted. And when I think of being rooted, I think of being held. So for me, being centered and feeling centered is actually about um, something bigger than me. So you know, immediately I, I just think of roots, the people that have sacrificed for me to be here and how me being centered might hold space for others. Um, and I think that if I am not centered in that way, as strongly as I'm able to be in any given moment, which shifts from time to time often, um, but if then I, it's hard to think of having 
uh, longevity and sustainability in a healthy, good way. So it's, when I hear that, um, it sounds important to me. I share that. I, I, I feel what Sharon has said too about the necessity for being centered. I have a little bit of resistance to the term center um, because it can, it could be understood to be um, static. And I don't think that that's what it means. Uh, but I, yeah, so when Sharon was talking about feeling rooted, I thought about a tree that is indeed rooted, but its limbs get to sway and move and kind of improvise a little bit. Um, and I know I'm, I'm in some ways just dealing with the semantics of the term centering, but I, I don't want to lose in that notion of being centered, um, flexibility and new possibility and so on. And I, and I know that's not Sharon at all what you intended. I, I, as I said, I share your sense of, of seeing centered as grounded, but I, I want to add to it some, some movement. It's funny to hear you too, because I, um, I live like right in the circle with you all in a different, <laughs> so it's a, it's not a fixed point for me. It's, mm -hmm. it's a state of dynamic balance. It's like the state right between one step and the next, mm -hmm. right? Where you could fall down or you could stay up, but it's moving. It's, it's like a breath. It's, it's not static. That's the thing I would the most agree with, that it's not a static state. Mm -hmm. And um, because I think if it gets static, it would be stagnant mm -hmm. and not resilient. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's... that's a little bit like walking or breathing or it's the it's almost liminal it's almost liminal mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um there's a couple of uh pieces coming up in the chat box too so uh nina just offered us advice from a tree um <laughs> and charlene offered a question um about remaining in this centeredness while moving which is such a big part of this module um, mm -hmm. and maybe a, one way we could get after that question is by um, exploring a question around um, how um, finding this dynamic center or this um, this place that is perhaps not fixed but helps um, to ground or root um, how does that help you to, or how has that or how does that help you to find your calling? <laughs> I chuckle because I'm not sure I found my calling. Uh, I, what I've learned to do is to pursue joy. And I don't know if that's my, I don't know if that leads me to the things that are my quote unquote calling or not, but they lead me to the things that I certainly enjoy. So um, that's, that's why I chuckle. I've been working with an image of myself as a turtle that I have my home on my back, wherever I go. And maybe that's, useful in this idea of um, flexible centering or something. Um, that the, the center is, is uh, maybe in our bones and in our muscles and blood. And, and it, 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 it can take us different places, but a sense of self and connectedness is it can be constant um constant might not be the right word but that that can be the part that feels stable that one that i can return to um yeah 
And it helps a lot for me to have incredible mirrors, people who are willing to help me see who I am and see me as my best self. Um, that's an important part of the grounding that I, I rely on. Um, I think I've been um, longing for love my whole life and I've come to discover that I actually already always had it. And so in my work, I kind of like wrote my way through getting to the realization of that, which also required a lot of digging into history, my family history, the history of our, the context of our lives, um, the history of my own emotional life and spiritual life. Um, it's required the release of things that I might have been holding that were toxic. Um, it's required forgiveness. It's required a humbleness that I didn't know I needed. And um, in retrospect, I can see that I was always working towards love, but I in fact always had it and I had to learn how to receive it. And it wasn't neat, that love, you know? It wasn't uh, without problems. It wasn't easy, um, but it was there. And so this is actually deeply connected to the project that I'm working on now um, in so many ways. But one of the, I, I think in the context of the spiritual and blood, the spiritual traditions and, and home traditions and blood traditions that, that I identify with as mine, um, trees fly. So I don't think of being held down um, by being rooted. I think of being lifted. And um, lately I've been especially appreciating the elders in my family. So a lot of them have passed. I don't have that many left, but I do have a crew of elders left in my family. And again, they show up in my work all the time. I've been like kind of in my own way studying them for a while to try to understand them and also grow and, and celebrate them. But they are raucous. They are rowdy. They always say inappropriate things. Um, they are unpredictable. Like they are so wild. But I so admire them because they live what I aspire to say I am. So I more and more am appreciating actions rather than words. So I don't need pretty, and I don't even appreciate anymore pretty languaging. I want to see who people are. And I don't care if they know how to say it in a nice, like if the intention is there, I'll, I'll get it. And if the intention is not there and it's not good, you know, I can drop that. But, um, all of that is like a swirling set of things that are, there's a lot of things happening at the same time and a lot of things that are true at the same time and it is rootedness for me. Oh. The part of that question that I just, that is um, working me a little bit. <laughs> and I know that we, can, we come up, we use this language all the time, but I'll own that it works me a little bit, is calling. Um, because I think that there, I have experienced calling to be understood as what we do mm. and how we, create livelihood for ourselves in the world. And that's not how I understand it. Um, so I balk a little bit when I hear it. 
so for me, all the 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 um, a little bit what Sharon's talking about in terms of being rooted, like being feeling my ancestors' presence with me, feeling the earth present, feeling nature present with me, feeling the generations before me and after present with me, kind of, and and trying to extend that into the way that I am and whatever I'm doing, it for me is a response to a calling. And that can be, that could look like anything. That could be a bricklayer. I mean, I don't really, I don't care much um, how that manifests because it usually finds its own expression um, almost by itself. I, I like forced, it forces me to, to be the vehicle for how it wants to express itself at any given moment. Um, yeah. Hmm. It would be great to keep this going as a dialogue. So if anyone wants to offer questions in the chat <laughs> box, so I see a really good juicy one. Oh. It's a big um, long one, yeah. And I also want to offer um, Omi and Sharon too, if you want to if respond to one another, if there's anything more to add on that conversation, um, I want to allow it to keep going. Um, Looks like folks are reading this question from Pinar and I'll just share it aloud. Um, Omi mentioned in the video that our intuition is blocked when we aren't paying attention. We aren't paying attention for a host of reasons that seem to be connected to our survival. My experience as an indigenous non-binary is that this is so true and further complexified with intersecting identities. How does tending to our intuition look different as folks BIPOC, queer, non-binary, trans, differently able-bodied, etc., who have higher survival needs in the dominant colonial